Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unchained Kentucky's June webinar, Recovery Allies and Recovery Friendly Communities. My name is Michelle Juma, Project Management Specialist at Shatterproof, and we have a fantastic 60-minute minute presentation for you today. Um, so let us know who's in the room by jumping into the chat and sharing things like your name, um, where you're from, what organization, organization you're a part of. Um, we'd love to see who is with us today. And let me make sure that is ready to go. Yes, the chat should be accessible now. We are live and ready to go. So this event is being recorded and will be made available on the Unshamed Kentucky website's events page, um, along with a copy of the presentation. All attendees will be muted throughout the hour, uh, but please feel free to use that chat box for any general commentary. It will not be monitored closely. Uh, so if you do have questions for our presenters, please put them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Our interpreters will also remain spotlighted throughout the session. But if you have trouble viewing any of our speakers, I suggest changing your view to gallery or side-by-side -side view by clicking view at the top right corner of your screen. Closed captioning um, is not currently available for this webinar, um, but you're welcome to turn on the automated feature at the bottom of your screen as well. The Unshamed Kentucky webinar series is brought to you in partnership with the Kentucky Opioid Response Effort and Shatterproof, and special thanks to the Kentucky Office of Vocational Rehabilitation for providing ASL's interpreting services for this event and all future webinars with the Unshamed Kentucky campaign. Our webinar will start off with this welcome, um, as well as an overview of the Unshamed Kentucky campaign before we go into our presentation on Recovery Allies. We'll close things out with the resources slides that you can follow up on after the event before closing at approximately 2 p.m. Eastern time. I'll pass things over to Ashley Riley Miller now to introduce our campaign. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Riley. I am the program coordinator on Unshamed Kentucky. I reside in Colorado, but Kentucky has a special place in my heart as I have actually been to treatment there. I am a person in recovery for eight and a half years. So the Unchained Kentucky webinar series is in partnership with the Kentucky Opioid Response Effort Corps and Shatterproof and a special thanks to Kelly Sanchez for um, her ASL interpreting and she's with ASL interpreting services in Louisville, Kentucky. I will be providing a brief overview of the Unchained Kentucky campaign, what our approach is, and we'll get moving along into our presentation today. So Unchained Kentucky is an evidence-based behavior change intervention aimed to reduce addiction-related stigma held by Kentuckians. The campaign is delivered by Shatterproof, um, a national nonprofit committed to ending the addiction crisis in the United States, and it is in close partnership with CORE. And this project is supported by CORE through a SAMHSA grant. The intervention has three main objectives. Our first is to increase knowledge about opioid use disorder and that recovery is not only possible, but it is probable with proper support. Second is to improve attitudes toward those living with and or in recovery from opioid use disorder. And lastly, to develop Kentuckians' understanding of the disease so people can better support loved ones with opioid use disorder. So now we're gonna talk about what does evidence-based mean? How do we do this? And we have a three pillar approach. First, we have community connection, which is super important. We partner with community-based organizations across the state where we at first conduct a needs assessment. This will let us know the areas we need to address we also have a community impact committee made up of people who reside in the state. They help give insight and keep a pulse on the campaign. We look at the areas we are hitting, where we can improve and how everything is being received in the state. Second, um, my favorite part of this is our story sharing. It's an important part of our campaign to put a face to the disease and really humanize people. We interview people who are in recovery 
people who have friends and family they have lost to disease or you know still living and they are in either active addiction or in recovery and then also what we call the heroes and these are the staff that provide treatment services and providers who serve this population this is known to create a much better connection between those affected and the general public which is increasing the empathy and understanding <clears throat> excuse me our last piece is education, which we provide through these well webinars, help it helps us to use, no use knowledge from our community-based organizations and knowledge from communities to figure out what are the exact messages we need to be putting out, and then we'll create webinars on these topics to help educate the general public. So these are the, the main points of our campaign. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can email me, which will be on the next slide, or you can um, visit unshameky.org, where you'll find more information. All right, so here's um, just a little slide, and it's about recovery allies and recovery friendly communities, which is what our presentation is about. And we have a great speaker who's going to speak on this topic. Um, Allison Jones Webb, she asked me to first um, share a little bit about my journey with recovery allyship, as I am a person in recovery for eight and a half years, and my story includes being sober from substances, or a person in recovery from substances, and also having a co-occurring mental health disorder. So I was just speaking earlier on community being the most important part of my recovery. And my, my recovery journey has evolved in the recovery pathways that I have been a part of. But what has been most important, especially when I had strained relationships with family, was having people in the community come up to me and say that I am welcome at their house. I am welcome with their to be part of their family. And I had one therapist, Jonathan, who I will say, is the best recovery ally I've ever had and still is. He, I've been sober since the first day I met him on February 4th of 2015. For the first year and a half of our therapy, he really helped me to identify um, triggers and coping mechanisms and work through the really tough year and a half. And he had said to me, when I moved out to Colorado, um, you have my number and if, if anything ever goes wrong or you need my help, I'm here for you. And I thought everything would go just fine as I had had a year and a half under my belt. Well, I also had a mental health disorder and I was struggling with deep depression. And I reached out to him and I said, this is really hard, I'm really struggling. And since that day, he has stayed in my life and it's been eight and a half years of constant contact every week. And coming from someone with a trauma history, that's really difficult because I didn't have people who stayed in my life over long periods of time. And he was a really good recovery ally. He educated himself. He had been in the field for 40 years and he knew how to support me through that. So I am really grateful for recovery friendly communities and people who um, understand what it's like to be a person with a substance use disorder. So now we're going to move along and I'm going to introduce Karen Atkins. She will give um, a introduction to our speaker and Karen is a community impact committee member with Unshamed Kentucky. So I'm going to pass that to her now. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, congratulations on eight and a half years. That is that is quite something to celebrate. Um, I'm so glad that Jonathan uh, was placed in your life, and he's just a, a true model of what a recovery ally is. Um, as Ashley mentioned, I'm Karen Atkins. I am the project director of a federal R Corps grant called MORE, which is Madison Opioid Response and Empowerment. Um, it is under the Kentucky River Foothills umbrella of services. We are a community action agency that serves rural Kentucky. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here today. Uh, the MORE program 
works to sustain the fight against opioid use disorder in Madison County. And when the Moore team learned about Unshamed Kentucky and the work that they are doing to address stigma, we enthusiastically became partners. Um, I am passionate about building recovery capital and supporting people in recovery and uh, was recently chosen to serve as a community impact committee member to help advance the work of the Unshamed Kentucky campaign. Um, you know, I am drawn to this work because I love the miracle of recovery. Um, it's not the stop using or the stop drinking, but the transformation of lives. And I, um, I educate myself and others to end stigma and I'm very fortunate to work in a field where I can help people. So I've always been a supporter, but it wasn't until last year that I even heard the term recovery ally. I landed in a conference session on recovery allyship and met today's presenter, Allison Jones Webb. As a result of attending her presentation, I launched our own recovery ally campaign in Madison County on two college campuses, Eastern Kentucky University and Berea College. That evolved into partnering with Unshamed Kentucky to host today's webinar with the goal of making our circle bigger. So I'm excited about today's presentation and for Allison to share the ways allies and our community can help build the recovery ecosystem and increase recovery capital. Uh, Allison is an author, public health specialist, and a passionate advocate for people in recovery. Her book, Recovery Allies, How to Support Addiction Recovery and Build Recovery-Friendly Communities, courageously tackles the root cause of substance use disorder, including trauma and mental health, and thoughtfully explores the barriers encountered by those in recovery, most especially shame and stigma. In her book, she lays out practical ways that communities can support people in recovery and why this is vitally important. Her overall message is there is hope and that we all have an important role in helping to support and sustain our community neighbors in their recovery journey. Allison, thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much, Karen. And thank you, Ashley, for sharing your story. Um, I uh, am always moved uh, by stories of people in recovery. Uh, like Karen, I'm drawn to the work because of that miracle of recovery. And um, because I believe that it is available to everyone, given the right supports, and that's up to us in the community to provide that um, supportive environment. Um, I also really liked uh, your story, Ashley, about uh, the ally in your life. Um, allies can be, you know, come from all different walks of life, and they can land in the lives of people in recovery in different ways. And uh, what I want to talk about today is how you can find that spot for yourself, uh, either personally or professionally, uh, to, to be an ally, and then what that means as you're building a recovery-friendly community. Um, and Karen, I just loved your presentation of, of yourself as an ally. It's uh, what I see you doing is being inspired and using your own skills and your network and where you are in your professional life to, uh, to support people in recovery. And that's really what it's all about. Uh, I am a family member, an affected family member. Um, I uh, come to this issue uh, from a family that has a lot of substance use disorder up and down the generations. Um, and uh, I also come to it from a professional point of view. So that's like a, a pretty interesting uh, intersection of the personal and the professional. Uh, and in my professional life, uh, I have focused particularly on building recovery support services in communities. Um, and in my personal life, you know, like uh, Ashley's ally, I really understand the importance of staying in touch, keeping connected, uh, no matter what happens uh, with my family members. Um, so with that, um, I want to say thank you to Moore and to uh, Unshamed Kentucky for having me here. And uh, I'm honored. I see so many people in the chat. This is just an awesome audience. Uh, and I hope uh, that um, I hope I can do justice to the topic. So next slide, please. 
So I'm going to be super targeted today in what I'm going to talk about, uh, because I know that, uh, so I've looked at some of the other Unshamed Kentucky um, webinars, and I know that there is an enormous amount that's going on in Kentucky uh, around recovery support services, and I think you all should be applauded for stepping up and figuring out how to address uh, the problem that's in our communities. I'm going to focus particularly on, well, I'm going to talk about the recovery allies, the recovery ecosystem. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about recovery capital because that is the building block for allies to use to build recovery-friendly communities. Um, so my book, uh, Recovery Allies, uh, uses two ways of kind of getting the word out about what we need to be doing to build uh, communities that where people in recovery can thrive. So first of all, it uses stories like Ashley's uh, to demonstrate uh, the second piece, which is research. Uh, so there's a fair amount of research on recovery uh, about what works and what doesn't work. And so that combination of storytelling and research uh, is what has kind of led me to this place to talk about recovery allies. Uh, next slide, please. So there's actually no formal definition of a recovery ally. I like this one. Uh, it's someone who uses their resources and connections to support people in recovery and the recovery community as a whole. Um, this, is, this allows us to think about ourselves. What is it that we have to offer? What is it maybe that our organization has to offer? Uh, where do I fit into the community where I could be more welcoming to people in recovery? It just allows us to think about different uh, ways that we can be involved. I've heard people also talk about recovery allies as people who have uh, connections to power. Um, so that's not me. I don't have a lot of power. Um, but there are people in positions of power who do uh, have, a, they, they can have a tremendous impact um, as recovery ally. But basically, for me, thinking about who you are and your position in the community, you get to figure out your own way of being an ally. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, we are all, we all live in the recovery ecosystem, whether we know it or not. And so this is just a little graphic uh, to help you figure out where you are in the recovery ecosystem. And so I think about the person in recovery sort of being in the center and then sort of concentric circles going out of people that um, either interact with individuals in recovery or have a lot to a lot of influence over what happens in their lives. So obviously the people closest to the person in recovery, um, often that's family members, uh, friends, uh, partners, spouses, um, are, are the sort of the first circle and those individuals that have a particular role to play in terms of, as we talked earlier about ma maintaining connection. Um, the next rung out, again, so family, friends, maybe a little bit further out in the family, like grandparents, um, the general social network that a person lives with, um, and then coworkers, if the person is employed, or fellow students, if the person is in school, neighbors, always, we all live in neighborhoods of some sort, um, and for many people, the faith community. And so, so that's sort of the next one out. We keep going out, um, and we, um, have people who are uh, maybe important to a person's recovery, but may not really be personally uh, sort of engaged around that person's recovery. So landlords who provide safe housing uh, and affordable housing to people in recovery um, at all stages of their recovery, but especially in early recovery. Um, employers, the same thing. So safe, uh, safe places where people in recovery can work and feel in, like they're in a safe environment at all stages of recovery. Um, financial institutions, for example, um, who can help uh, do education around fi financial management, but who also can help people restructure their, fi their finances, restructure their debt. Uh, sometimes people in early recovery need that. Um, and then there are professionals that are more in the field. So um, counselors, healthcare providers, um, social service providers, teachers, professors, law enforcement officers, faith leaders, um, and harm reductionists who may have sort of interpersonal connections with people in recovery. And so um, the next circle, again, we're getting further and further removed, but no less important, 
are business owners in the community where people in recovery buy their stuff um, or um, engage, you know, receive services. Um, Local decision makers uh, who may be making, uh, for example, decisions about zoning uh, or other types of um, land use uh, ordinances that impact, in this case, would be housing. Um, researchers who help us find out more about uh, recovery. There's a lot of re recovery research going on now, which is pretty exciting. Um, and also it helps us understand, look, there's some things that we can do that work better than other things. Um, public housing, family drug courts, uh, all of these um, are, are where allies sort of can be. And last, but absolutely not least, um, are people that make policy decisions at the state and federal level and people who have a decision-making ability about money. Um, and so while they may not be directly um, involved with the recovery community, um, although many, many, many of them have a direct uh, experience with someone in recovery, um, they have every, they have a lot of influence over what our recovery friendly communities can look like. So next slide, please. So now if we put the person in recovery, like in the center of our, you know, concentric circles, and we have a bunch of them in our community, our community starts to look like this, where there's people in recovery, all of those allies that actually are overlapping, uh, not only with uh, other people in recovery, but they're also lap overlapping with each other. And we essentially have a network of people who um, can choose to be recovery allies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to like harp on recovery uh, capital. So recovery capital has been well studied. Uh, this is a pretty standard definition, although there are others in the literature. Recovery capital is the sum total of one's resources that can be brought to bear on the initi initiation and maintenance of substance misuse cessation. I'm going to call that recovery. Um, and so the research shows us uh, there are different ways of sort of slicing and dicing recovery capital, but generally the research shows us that there's personal recovery capital, social recovery capital, and community recovery capital. And so as I go on and talk about these different types of recovery capital, I hope you'll be thinking in your own heads about where you are in that recovery ecosystem. So we already sort of situated a bunch of different roles that people may have, either personal or professional roles. And then how, uh, where you are in that community, how you can build recovery capital. So next slide. So personal recovery capital is really what belongs to the person, not literally, well, sometimes belongs, like basic needs um, that are met, but it's things that are, are, have to do with the individual. And so it has to do with their physical health, their mental health, uh, the, their work, their education, it also has to do with their internal skills. So problem solving skills, uh, resilience is a really important uh, element of personal recovery capital, being able to manage finances, um, self-esteem also a tremendously important aspect of personal recovery capital. And then where that person finds herself or himself in a belief system, the culture, cultural identity, that's all the, in, the individual and all of those things can be positive or negative. Uh, so you can have positive recovery capital, or let's say you don't have ba your basic needs met. That is very definitely negative recovery capital. And so um, thinking about where you are, uh, if you're a healthcare provider, if you're an educator, uh, if you work for a community-based organization and you're really pretty good at organizing things, um, all of those, uh, all of those things can be really helpful to a person to build their personal recovery capital. Okay, next. So then social recovery capital is, it's exactly what it says it is. It's where that individual then interacts. And so social recovery capital has to do with relationships with family and friends. And I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a fair amount of research on family, the role of the family, and a lot of treatment agencies will bring families in 
Um, but if we keep in mind that um, most people who are in recovery don't go to treatment, uh, that the support that families provide is important, whether there's treatment or not. Uh, and there's there are a lot of resources available for families to learn how to be supportive. Same for friends. Uh, peers in recovery, there's a tremendous amount of research on peer, uh, peer support. Um, and that peer support that's often found in 12-step programs or other um, support groups. Um, and, um, you know, building uh, peer opportunities for peers to be together uh, in, for example, recovery community centers is very important. Um, support that one has for a partner, a spouse, clearly, uh, if you're in a relationship, uh, you know, the, the partner or the spouse can uh, be very helpful or can actually contribute to negative recovery capital. A breakup, for example, is a very difficult time. Uh, it's a time when, when that social recovery capital actually depreciates. Um, and so, uh, so partners and spouses are important. And then just generally out in the community, uh, community events that involve everybody, including people in recovery, or just general community events where people get together, we are with each other, um, and we we welcome everyone. Uh, and that general sense of community uh, is a very, very important aspect of social recovery capital. So one of the things that I like to say is, you know, sometimes um, people that live in rural areas where resources are slim uh, may say, well, we don't have anything here. We don't have any resources here. And I would challenge that because if we look at this social recovery capital, not not much of those elements like take very many resources in terms of money, but a sense of community is something that we can all build. Recovery related social events, something we can all do. Um, and so uh, so I, I, I think of every community as having the potential to have a great deal of recovery capital. Um, next slide, please. And then community recovery capital, it's a, you know, so it's the resources essentially that are available in the community that will support uh, recovery. And so that is treatment because people may enter recovery and then have a return to use and need treatment services again. Um, and then the very specific recovery support services like housing, uh, peer recovery centers um, and so forth and harm reduction services. So people in recovery may uh, choose to start using again. And if they do, pretty important to have a safe uh, way for them to use uh, and you know a, a place where they feel like they can go uh, even when they start using again, which may be discouraging for family members, but maybe what happens in their in their lives. Same thing with diversion programs. So um, if a person uh, is is using, got in trouble with the law, uh, we all know that as soon as uh, a person is involved in the criminal justice system, uh, their lives change tremendously. And so kind of keeping keeping diversion programs, keeping people out of that system are pretty important. Faith-based organizations, I want to say something about this because um, I know that in Kentucky, the church is a very, very important institution. Uh, I come from the great state of Maine, uh, where churches are far less important. Um, and so far less important as a community, uh, part of the community. And what I want to say about this is that faith-based organizations are tremendously important. And I think it's important to recognize that some people in recovery have been harmed by some messages that they may have received in the church and that we um, in, the, in the faith community need to be sensitive to what what to the journey that people in recovery have taken uh, that where they find themselves in a church or in a faith-based organization and just kind of understand what might have uh, led them there. So general attitudes that support recovery, I'm not going to talk very much about stigma. Uh, I think Unshamed Kentucky has that uh, has that one down. Uh, and it's it seems to me like uh, there's been a lot of focus on that in, in Kentucky. But th those attitudes uh, that are supportive of recovery are probably more important than you know. So the research is really clear that one reason that people don't seek help whatever kind of help that might be. Maybe it's it's a 12-step program, maybe it's treatment, maybe it's a faith-based organization. The reason people don't seek help is because of shame. They're ashamed to admit they have a problem. They don't wanna tell their family members about it. Uh, and so our attitudes about being accepting of 
yep, I know you got a problem. Come on, let's figure out how to deal with it together are very important. And then the rest of the, you know, community recovery capital has to do with advocacy. And, you know, I, I, I hear in Karen's voice, you know, she's a natural advocate. Like she really wants to be there advocating and supporting uh, people in recovery. Advocacy takes so many different forms. Um, I uh, personally get involved in policy change, uh, that type of advocacy. Um, and it takes everyone in the, not everyone, it takes a lot of individuals in the community to participate in that. Uh, there may be some um, local issues that come up, for example, around placement of recovery housing, where there's opposition to that. There is a perfect advocacy opportunity locally to do some education. Here's actually what recovery housing is. Here's how you can be supportive of people in recovery. Here's why I am in favor of recovery housing. Here's the law around recovery housing. And so advocacy of different types is also very important. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so why did I spend so much time on recovery capital? Why do we need to know about it? So. Um, this quote, uh, how do people get better? This quote from Dr. David Best pretty much says it all. So he's done extensive research on people in recovery, uh, very uh, detailed research. And what his research has found in a nutshell, how do people get better? They change their social network. So that's that social capital and they engage in meaningful activities. And so, and there's actually some community capital there as well as per, uh, personal recovery capital. So, so if you think, well, I don't really know anything about recovery or that's not my job or, well, that's, you know, that's my neighbor's, you know, her husband helps her. Actually changing social networks, we all can participate in that and engaging in meaningful activities. We all can participate in that as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's there are many, many definitions of recovery-friendly communities. In a way, uh, the definition doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a community that's welcoming to people in recovery. Um, I like to say it's people, places, and policies. Uh, so we're talking about people now. Uh, we talked a little bit about locations like uh, recovery community centers, uh, churches that are welcoming, and then policies. Uh, so all of those kind of put together are welcoming to individuals in recovery. Next slide. So uh, there we are in the background. There's our uh, community of people in recovery plus all of their allies. There are four pillars of recovery. Again, this is based on research, um, and they fall into these categories of health, home, purpose, and community. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, I'll just go through them fairly quickly. So health, you know, usually we think about health as access to health care, our physical health, taking care of our bodies. It also includes our minds and our hearts and our spirits. And so it's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Um, and this, I find, is a, is a place where a lot of people can be uh, supportive of people in recovery. Um, for example, uh, you know, I have enjoyed uh, going to uh, mindfulness meditations with people in recovery. They take me to their, you know, their place. It's really fun. It's really cool. Um, I've also uh, helped a family member go to a doctor to get help. Um, and so lots of different ways there that access to, we can help with access to health and you know at much higher levels access to health care having to do with what is what is health insurance companies reimburse what is Medicaid reimburse and so there's all kinds of levels here of access to health care and then within the healthcare system healthcare providers who understand addiction and recovery and know about local resources so there's a fair amount of literature also about um, un for recovery unfriendly um, healthcare providers, where people who go to the doctor feel very stigmatized for their uh, for their past substance use, and so they don't bring it up. And uh, in fact, that's kind of a dangerous situation because that's part of your health history. It's a really important uh, to be able to talk to your healthcare providers about it. Um, general wellness opportunities, I mentioned mindfulness, that runs the whole gamut. There are so many ways that we can be healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Outdoor activities, again. And again, you know, this gets back to communities who say, we don't have any resources. Well, for rural communities, you've got the great outdoors. 
Um, and so engaging in activities outdoors, for example, um, and then cultural engagement. So whatever that cultural engagement is, if it's a, if it's um, Native American practices, if it's your local practices, local communities do things differently, um, engaging people in that as, as, um, as a part of their uh, wellness. Uh, next slide. So um, home uh, doesn't mean a house. It doesn't just mean like a house where there's, uh, you know, beds and food in the kitchen. Uh, it really means a place where there's a supportive environment, where there's accountability, um, and where people uh, feel uh, feel like they're a part of they're a part of what's going on in the in in the home. Um, and so that can be any number of things. It doesn't mean necessarily a family home. It can be a friend's home. It can be shared apartment. It's a lot of different things. Um, so I'm going to talk about recovery residences first. So recovery residences often where people uh, in who have a severe addiction go into after they come out of treatment or after they come out of incarceration. Um, recovery residences are a really, really important part of the continuum of care. And as allies, there are so many things that we can do to support recovery housing. Uh, we can be good neighbors to people to recovery residences that are in our neighborhood. We can educate our neighbors. We can educate other people in the community about why we support recovery housing. Um, we can get involved directly with a recovery house. Uh, that's a lot of fun uh, to to engage with the people who are living in the house and provide. Outdoor, opportun oppor outdoor opportunities, cultural opportunities, and so forth. Um, and very often employers link with recovery residences to create um, opportunities, obviously opportunities for employment for people living there. And in that same, uh, in that same vein, recovery friendly housing policies. And so, you know, there are a lot of uh, municipalities that have uh, discriminated against recovery residences. There's a lot of uh, local uh, and state and I think federal law around that. Um, and so understanding what your local policies are and understanding what's permitted and not permitted uh, in terms of allowing a recovery residents to be in a neighborhood is, is important. And beyond uh, policies around recovery residences, policies generally around housing that makes housing available and affordable uh, is, is important. And so I think about um, you know, many communities have uh, housing coalitions that often are dealing with um, people who don't have houses, but that's not the only issue that housing coalitions can, can address. Um, and then landlords. And so I mentioned this earlier, and I'll say it again. Landlords are so important. Everybody needs a place to live. Many people rent. Uh, and so um, having landlords who understand addiction and recovery, understand that when you're in recovery, that doesn't reflect on your use. It reflects on your new life in of healing. Um, and so perhaps uh, activities that you engaged in when you were in active use are not going to be the same as in recovery. And then um, having landlords who don't discriminate, particularly when it comes to a past uh, uh, criminal um, convictions. Um, next slide. So purpose, this is again, this is one place where this is not a specialized area. This is something we can all participate in. So purpose basically means, you know, what we do that gives us meaning in our lives. And so often that's work. Sometimes it's education. Uh, very often it's our families uh, and um, very clearly faith communities where we go and we find uh, a greater purpose um, in our lives. And then purpose doesn't need to be in work. It can also be in volunteer opportunities. And so wherever you are in the community, um, I feel like this is a really good way to think about something that you may be able to contribute as a recovery ally. Okay, next one. Um, and so then I, I touched on this um, so recovery support services, including recovery community centers, making sure there's a wide range of recovery support groups, um, engaging the community in listening sessions so that they're educated about um, addiction. And I have to say that that is an ongoing issue. It doesn't, a, a one-off doesn't do it. 
the research is pretty clear that you know the the message of uh, anti discrimination and prejudice uh, it gets stale after a certain period of time. So you have to keep going out, uh, going back at it. Um, and also, as resources change, you want to educate the community about changing resources. Uh, providing substance-free activities, recovery ally trainings, I love that one, uh, and then recovery rallies. Many communities are having recovery rally, rallies during recovery month. Next slide. So actions for allies. So now you know why I'm talking about recovery capital so much is that we are at our best when we help build recovery capital. So whether it's personal, social, or community, that's what we can do. Next slide. So um, I uh, this is this is uh, probably not what you're thinking uh, when you say actions for allies, and I say start with yourself. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to look inside, uh, and maybe you've already done this. But if you have already done it, do it again. Uh, in my experience, you know my own attitudes towards substance use and recovery have changed over time. Uh, as I learn more, as I engage with different people, uh, as I mature myself. And so um, start thinking about your own attitudes uh, and where you might need to do a little growth yourself. Um, I think that it's really not fair um, of allies to expect all that growth to happen uh, among people in recovery. We have some responsibility for that too. So sim similarly, getting educated about addiction, harm, harm reduction and recovery services in your area uh, what they mean, um, you know, if understanding treatment, that's really helpful, except that there are lots of different kinds of treatment. And if you're in a position to help someone find treatment, knowing the right treatment at the right time is really pretty important. Uh, learning about resources in your community. Uh, and I want to say online because there's a tremendous amount online now, even, you know, since the book, uh, since I was working on the book, those resources have just exploded. And there are a lot of good ones. There are a lot of good ones for family members, a lot of good ones for parents. There are podcasts. There's all kinds of stuff that's really helpful for education. And then as you're thinking about that, you're starting with, it's like, hmm, what can I do? Develop your own action plan. Make it, make it concrete. Here's what I'm going to do to support a person in recovery, a specific person, or people in recovery generally. Next slide. Okay, so the people closest to individuals in recovery have a special role to play uh, in my mind. Um, and uh, I say family and friends, but you know, it could be a special employer, uh, a counselor, um, but they are where positive regard happens unconditional positive regard. They have the ability to change the conversation in a person's life, uh, to create hope. We can all create hope, but especially people that are really close to an individual in recovery, they can start expanding those networks of people uh, that aren't using substances, introducing people to other friends or taking them to other social events, finding resources we've talked about. The research is very, very clear. I mentioned this earlier about the importance of spouses and partners, both in positive recovery capital and then in negative recovery capital when there's stress in that relationship. And for women, the research is also pretty clear that uh, living with their children is a Im very important part of, of their uh, journey to wellness. And so if you're involved at all with a person's children, if you're in uh, the child services sector, um, finding finding ways, whatever that means, to um, bring mothers. It's true for fathers also, but it's the research is clear with mothers. Bring them back to their to their children is very important. And then just generally meaningful activities could be making you know cooking meals together. Uh, it could be taking a hike. But um, we have that when, when we're close in on in that circle, we have that. Uh, ability. Next slide. So now this is where you can figure out how what you're going to do next. How are you going to create that action plan? So what pillar in, in this uh, home health purpose and community, where are you perhaps in your professional life? If you're a pastor or if you're a social worker, or if you're a child care provider, what is your role and how can you promote recovery now that you understand the importance of recovery capital? And then what are your personal and professional strengths? 
So I turn out to be a super, super good organizer um, and a good writer. And so I have um, worked with nonprofits uh, in sort of organizational development and um, strategic planning and so forth um, So that are in the recovery field. And so that's one thing that I have uh, contributed. That's how I kind of looked at my personal and professional strengths. If you, if you have... Um, if you have a position in the community where people know you, uh, might be a pastor, might be a business person, could be a banker, uh, become a champion. Think about if you if you want to take on that role, if you want to be the one that stands up and says, I support the recovery community. I've learned this about recovery. I, uh, I am so hopeful about people in recovery. Um, I would like to participate in the rally in September, what have you, um, to become a champion where you talk out loud about it. And then like Karen, if you find your passion, uh, where you really love watching just that miracle occur where people, people become, you know, who they are and then some. Um, where can you do, where is your passion? Because if you don't love it, you probably won't do it for very long. And I'm going to end, I have one more slide, but I'm going to end with please ask, where's the evidence? So there's an awesome website, recoveryanswers.org. It will answer all of your questions from a research point of view about recovery, what we know, what we don't know. So if you're curious about trying something out, uh, go here, check it out, uh, see if that might be something that the evidence supports. Next slide. So let's get to work. And then I think my la the contact my contact yeah my contact information is there on the last slide. So thank you everybody. I think we may have some time for questions and answers. Happy to um, happy to do that. And if you would like to contact me directly, I'm happy to uh, to respond to that also. Thank you so much, Allison. That was fantastic, and we are very grateful to have you here today and learn from your expertise. So we had two questions come into the chat here. Um, you may not know the first one because I think it revolves around people who reside in Kentucky, but I'll ask it anyways and um, see. Um, so it says, are there any stipulations on opening sober livings or anything in the state of Kentucky? Um, what I can say is that usually because housing is typically a local issue there, I don't believe it would be a state level issue. Um, but what I have learned uh, is that recovery housing is pretty complicated. The policies around recovery housing is pretty complicated and definitely varies by state. Same thing with funding. Uh, so I, um, I guess I would point you to the direction of the Fletcher group, for example, they know everything about housing. Um, and you have, I don't know what the name of the organization is, but you do have a body that certifies um, recovery housing in Kentucky, and that's an important resource as well. Oh, there's somebody put it in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know Karen shared some resources and she'll be sharing um, some more in a bit. Okay. Um, next one is a great question. How does a family balance being an ally without enabling abuse, abusing behaviors? So that is an excellent question. It's one that I get a lot. And so I always say, so first of all, I'm not a clinician, so I don't do counseling or therapy. Um, but what I understand from the research is that uh, every family does this differently. And so knowing your family and setting boundaries within your family about what is acceptable behavior for everyone, not just the person who may be using um, so knowing what the boundaries are, talking about the boundaries, being very clear about talking about them, and then holding each other accountable uh, in a loving way seems to be effective. And, and some families, for some families, um, some families will find it, uh, find that their boundary is you can't use in my house. You're, I'm kicking you out if you're using. And other families don't have that same boundary. Uh, and so... I don't have a suggestion, but the suggestion is create your boundaries. And mostly when, when we as allies are creating boundaries, we're also protecting ourselves uh, to maintain our own wellness and our own mental health uh, so that we're available, right? We're available and we're maintaining a connection with a person that we love, but uh, we are setting very clear boundaries that that person is aware of uh, that we've talked about. 
Thank you, Allison. Um, that is a great answer. Um, this one I'm also curious about. How does recovery capital look different for adolescents and young adults in recovery from uh, substance use disorder? So really, really good question. So if you're an adult uh, in recovery, you've had a life of experience that kind of leads you up to recovery. You may already have your education in place. You may already have had a job. You may already have been a parent um, when you're young. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, people in their 20s and then I'll talk about adolescents, but people in their 20s, you know, uh, may have had their, their education interrupted uh, and so they may want to focus on that. Uh, they may actually have fewer health consequences uh, because they haven't been using so long. So that's like a really positive thing. Um, they may be uh, they may be work ready because they again haven't been using for quite a long period of time. So their um, their opportunities for expanding their own uh, personal recovery capital, I think, are greater in many ways. And for adolescents, um, you know, this is such a such a difficult issue. Um, so adolescents, a lot of an adolescent's recovery capital is their family. And so when families are um, not able to support an adolescent, finding some, finding a, finding a, a so, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Finding someone who can be, play that supportive role. Um, and then we also know, you know, there are not very many treatment options available for adolescents. We've done, not done a very good job of that in the United States. So uh, being an advocate for more adolescent treatment um, and, you know, protecting an adolescent from those networks that, uh, that were harmful in the past. Thank you, Allison. Um, I, I have time for maybe about one or two more. Um, the next question is, what strategies can professionals and organizations implement to be recovery allies? So really good question. I will say that there are a lot of resources for recovery-friendly employers, uh, and Karen's going to share some of that. So go on, or there, there are plenty of resources online for what constitutes a recovery-friendly employer. Um, as, an, as an organization, you know, you can start, again, start looking inside uh, and, you know, do some reflection, uh, self-reflection, but also do some education among your staff. Um, there are just so many myths out there about what recovery is and um, what addiction is, for that matter. And so doing some education and then maybe ask within your organization, where is our energy? Like, what do we want to do uh, that where where we could be a positive force in the community around recovery? So I would think about it that way. I would also go to recoveryanswers.org uh, to to just see what some of the things are that are um, that are known to work. Also, I'll just add one other thing. Uh, as organizations, sometimes we think about the person who is uh, in recovery without realizing that their family members need a lot of support. And so in organizations, you know, nine times out of 10, there's an individual who's an employee who has a family member. And so finding ways to support that family member, if you have an EAP, uh, making sure that that, um, that that EAP covers uh, support for families, counseling, what have you, and checking your insurance policies to make sure that uh, that treatment is covered. Uh, if you have a, either a person in recovery or a person, a family member who needs time off, uh, those are some of the things that you could have a conversation about um, to be a, a recovery-friendly organization, even if not employer. Thank you. We just had one last one come in, and this will be our last question before we move on to resources. Um, what has been your experience in creating recovery community centers? Um, my experience, so I have been involved in the creation of recovery community center, uh, which I could share, but I think, um, and that was a, that was very much a grassroots, uh, local, local people in recovery wanted it. Uh, they got some minimal funding from the state. They started it. Uh, they definitely experienced a lot of stigma uh, in finding a place, uh, in explaining to landlords, no, this is not where people are going to come and use drugs. It's quite the opposite. Um, and, you know, in terms of getting it off the ground, started a little bit slow um, and uh, took off. 
Um, and I'm happy to talk to this person on the side also, but I will say that it's different in every state. And so what I have observed is that, man, the, the, the way that the local recovery community is actually pretty different state to state. And so the recovery community center is going to reflect uh, the way that the, you know, how recovery happens uh, in your state or in your community. But I'm happy to um, engage further on that question. All excellent answers. Thank you so much, Allison. And we are going to um, move on to Karen Atkins. So just provide a few resources briefly to anyone in the state of Kentucky who may be looking for them. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, Just waiting for that to pull up. Um, I do uh, feel like it was really important um, to bring up some of the local resources that we have around the state um, as it relates to this topic. And the first one is, um, you know, as a part of CORE, which is Kentucky Opioid Response Effort, the Kentuckiana Health Collaborative developed an employer toolkit. Um, and this provides recommendations and tools for employers to support their employees and their dependents in prevention, treatment, and recovery from opioid misuse and opioid use disorder. And we will share links to all these resources. Um, recovery Ready com Communities, which we, we just talked about, um, they make sure communities have the tools to help people who are suffering. They reduce stigma on addiction. They get people into recovery. They help people uh, meet needs like transportation and housing. And they help people get into employment so that they can get their life back together and their families back together. And these centers are an important tool to ensure that there is help for those in our communities. And I think that I am talking about the wrong slide. Am I getting ahead of myself? I am so sorry. Well, we are on uh, the Kentucky comeback here. This is a campaign, sorry about that, that was uh, launched by the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce to change the stigma around substance use disorder and make positive changes in the criminal justice system. Um, they partnered with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to create the campaign um, that is working to build a criminal justice reform network and attract a greater number of businesses and leaders across the state to engage in criminal justice reforms with the goal of fewer Kentuckians incarcerated, more individuals gainfully employed, and a stronger, healthier Kentucky economy. Uh, the founded by Ernie and Glenna Fletcher, that should uh, sound very familiar to, to everyone on the audience. Uh, Ernie is a, is a former governor of Kentucky, and the Fletcher Group helps uh, move people past uh, the disease of addiction and devastation of homelessness to lives of dignity and fulfillment. They provide technical assistance to rural communities so that they can benefit significantly from safe, uh, sustainable recovery housing and other best practices uh, services. They are also one of the three rural centers of excellence nationwide and the only one in Kentucky. So I did get ahead of myself. And so here is the Recovery Community Center information. I will say that in, uh, in our area, we have one in Madison County. Um, we have the Dry Dock. And then we also have one in Winchester, which is a neighboring uh, county, Clark County, one county over. And they, I have been to both. And they are significantly different because they are peer led. Um, and so if you have a chance, if you have one in your community, I would love just to encourage you to, uh, to visit. Um, I'll tell you, when I was in Clark County uh, a couple weeks ago uh, with an expungement fair, I was impressed that someone needing work hours just walked in and stated that, and they were immediately taken back. 
to start working on, on the hours that they needed. So, so very impressed by that center. And lastly here, uh, the University of Kentucky has a collegiate recovery program called POWER, and that is Prevention, Outreach, and Wellness Education Resources. Um, they offer nine programs and, and services, including alcohol um, and other drugs and a collegiate recovery community. They have a weekly uh, recovery meetings that are entirely student-led. Um, they also have embraced the locks boxes around campus. So, so excellent work, UK. Um, as I mentioned before, in Madison County, um, you know, we, pro we host prevention events at Eastern Kentucky University and Berea College. Um, and last year we did launch that Recovery Ally campaign on both campuses, but um, both have taken off and uh, are being student led now so we 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 put that into place and it's it's now living on its own so that's that's wonderful and then lastly this is a, a, a webinar that the more program is going to have as a follow-up to this one next month on july 27th it is a recovery allyship webinar that will include a discussion moderated by a more consortium member, Mindy Goebel. Um, this discussion will feature a panel of diverse recovery allies and people with lived experience, um, and they will explore the importance of recovery allies. Thank you, Karen. Collegiate recovery communities are close to my heart as I got sober in one. So thank you for sharing all of that information, all of those resources. Um, again, Allison, great presentation. Love having you here. Um, thank you again to our ASL interpreter. Someone had a comment about that, um, Kelly Sanchez. So thank you for that. And you can email me at ariley at shatterproof.org, which is up here. If you have any questions about our campaign, and I can send you the links to if you want to share your story, if you want to become a community based organization or get involved in some way so that will conclude our presentation, thank you so much everyone.